What would it look like if your supercar were designed not for posing at Cars and Coffee, but to be the fastest road legal car around any racetrack anywhere in the world? And what would happen if that track were Le Mans? Well, surely he's not insinuating that the McLaren Senna were somehow secretly engineered to race at Le Mans. Well, I am, and don't call me Shirley. Oh, I got an airplane reference in even before the opening credits. <laughs> Here's what you didn't know about the Senna. See, the project that McLaren originally called the P15 wasn't meant for the road at all. No, no, this was to be McLaren's entry at the 24 hours of Le Mans. The public never saw that P15, though apparently some sketches came pretty close to what it was gonna look like with a full length dorsal fin and a sexy Audi R18 looking body. Thanks to a bunch of boring things that always seem to kill off the cool cars like money and politics and sanctioning body rule changes, McLaren had to kill off the P15. But it was far enough in development that the company could turn it into something else to make some cash. And so the P15 was reborn as the Senna. Amongst its range of supercars, the Senna would be the fastest track car that McLaren could make street legal. The P15 Senna doesn't look like it did when it was a P15 Le Mans car. Why? I have no idea. But it doesn't really matter because the Senna doesn't have to look like anything to our eyes. It just needs to look great to the wind. Because downforce, which gives you the advantage of weight, i.e. traction coming out of corners, stupid cornering forces and ridiculous braking, without having to accelerate, turn, or brake that mass. Downforce is the most important tool engineers have to make a car go fast around a track. You'll note I use the word tool and that's for a reason. All right, think about it this way. If I sent you out into the wilderness and told you you could only bring one tool, you'd bring something like this. It's a multi-tool and that's because it has the greatest likelihood of being useful at something. But if you can have a lot of tools, you don't want a multi-tool. You want a bunch of individual tools that are good at specific tasks. Like for example, a spark plug socket, which is remarkably good at removing spark plugs. Or a side cutter, which you could use to cut the brake lines on your wife's boyfriend's truck. Or a pipe wrench, which you could use to bash in his skull. But if you could only have one car, well, it needs to be able to do everything. And that's why your side piece drives a Lexus SUV. If you can have only one supercar, it has to be pretty and comfortable and have windows that open, just like all of the other less expensive McLarens. But if you can spend a million bucks on a track toy, you have other cars to do other things, and that allows the Senna track toy to be singularly focused on going fast around a track. To that end, the first goal is always to get rid of the weight. Oh, McLaren's old. This car weighs only 2,641 pounds. Ugh, that's dry weight. That's like me saying I weigh 150 pounds. If you drain out all of my blood and all of the other bodily fluids like cerebrospinal fluid and don't forget the aqueous humor, old chap, just suck it right out of my eyeballs. No, sir, the Senna weighs 3,030 pounds with coolant, oil, and a full tank of gas, which ain't a lot because it's got 800 horsepower or 789 if you prefer American horses. McLaren says it's its lightest car since the tiny little F1. The body panels weigh just 132 pounds, which you believe when you touch them. The doors, less than 20. The seats, even less. The rear wing weighs less than 11 pounds, but it creates more than 100 times that in downforce. At 155 miles an hour, the Senna's body makes 1,750 pounds of downforce. And that's the limit. I mean, that's kind of a lot of weight for the suspension and tires to deal with. So as you're driving, the wing can change its angle to make sure it doesn't make too much downforce. Top speed is only 208 miles an hour. But remember, downforce means more drag. If you want to go faster, McLaren has another seven-figure specialty tool for that, the 250 mile an hour speed tail. The Senna is focused completely on Le Mans, Le, 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 tap, lap times. Lap, time, <coughs> lap times, lap times. Uh, first things first, straight line speed. The car and driver testing team got zero to 60 in 2.8 seconds. And then the car did the quarter mile in 10.1, which is two tenths of a second slower than the 1200 horsepower Bugatti Veyron Supersport. 
but it's doing 147 miles an hour, which is one mile an hour faster. And while the Bugatti pulls an impressive, especially for its time, 0.99 g around a skid pad, the Senna pulls 1.12. And on the skid pad, speeds are low. With downforce, the faster you go, the more grip there is. 1.12G is just the beginning. Same with braking. It too gets better the faster the center goes, but even at slow speeds, the center crucifies everything. It stops from 70 miles an hour, almost 40 feet shorter than a Volkswagen GTI, beating even the best Porsche 911s. McLaren likes to point out that there isn't a single horizontal line on the Senna that doesn't pass through an intake or a vent. And viewed from up above, well, it's, it's just a teardrop with a wing. It doesn't matter what angle you look at it from, aerodynamics ruled the design of this car. The Senna uses a four liter version of the flat plane crank twin turbocharged V8 whose origins McLaren doesn't really want to talk about. And that's because it comes from another manufacturer. It's built by Ricardo, but it all comes from a Nissan engine. And you kind of understand why McLaren doesn't want to talk about its car as having a Nissan engine. But this isn't an engine from like a Sentra. Although Sentra, Senna, they're only a couple letters off. No, 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 no. This is not a street engine. This is a racing engine that raced at racetracks around the world, including one in France. You may have heard of it. The Senna follows the same format as all the other McLaren cars. Mid-engine, seven-speed dual clutch, rear-wheel drive, two seats, carbon tub, hydraulic steering. <sighs> McLaren makes the best steering in the business. And that's because it's electrohydraulic, which is another way of saying it's hydraulic, but the pump runs off of a motor rather than the engine. Whatever. Because it's hydraulic, it feels good, but it can't do things like park itself or like lane keep. <laughs> the Senna has absolutely no time for your BS and your complaints. Uh, this is a stressful car to drive. It's loud inside, as it should be. You were the one who bought the McLaren. You should get to enjoy all the noise. <laughs> The suspension is, well, if you had to guess how stiff the suspension needs to be to support one and a half times the car weight because of the downforce. It's hard as a rock. Oh, and in race mode, the car lowers itself another inch and a half up front and 1.2 in the rear. Don't drive it in that mode on the street unless you don't like your teeth. The Senna doesn't use anti-roll bars. In their place, it uses shock absorbers that are diagonally cross-connected via hydraulic lines. With one valve each for compression and rebound, these connections can almost fully eliminate body roll in corners. The only body roll in this car is gonna be you. But with seats this supportive, you're not really going all that far. The seats are a lot more comfortable than they look, but they're definitely not wider. In fact, the entire cabin is really tight and the cutouts in the door, well, they actually help in giving a little bit of sense of space when you're driving, even if it comes at the expense of privacy. Uh, guys, guys, eyes up here, eyes up here, up here, yeah. Um, because the car comes standard with six point race harnesses, all of the controls need to be within easy reach. And to that end, the transmission gear selector moves with the driver's seat, which is really cool. Plus it says DNR, which cracks me up because that means do not resuscitate. In other words, if I've died in my McLaren, don't bring me back because now you know I'm wearing blue high heel shoes. The door releases and window switches are on the ceiling, which means you can spend hours laughing at your friends trying to get out. Oh, and those door releases are electric only. In case of a malfunction, there's an emergency release behind you, which you can't reach. And the gauges, well, that's just the silliest thing in the world. All right, this is the kind of stuff that kills me. Such are the weight-saving measures that the Senna's calibers do not feature the raised McLaren logo so prominently shown on other members of the ultimate. Really? Like, really? You shave off a couple of micrograms of metal from the brake calipers, and then you go put in a twin-screen rotating LCD gauge cluster that puts a thousand times that weight back in the car? Oh, come on. And then there's the optional seven speaker Bowers and Wilkins stereo system, which is remarkably light at 16 pounds. You start to wonder whether removing those little McLaren logos was actually about weight savings. And how much weight could you really save anyway? I mean, if there's one criticism of McLaren's cars is that they're all the same. Same basic tub, same engine, same transmission. You're just not going to be able to pull out a thousand pounds. Apparently they didn't need to because no matter who's tested the Senna and where they've taken it, it's always been faster than everything else. Look, it's not traditionally sexy, but there are other McLarens for that. This car had one job to do and it did it well. 
I've had that multi-tool for years, possibly, honestly, even decades. I have never used it because there's always been a better tool for whatever job I'm doing. If I need to replace a spark plug, I'm certainly not gonna use a multi-tool. I'll use a spark plug socket. And if I wanna do it quickly, I'll put it on a gun. And that is the McLaren Senna. One tool, one job, done quickly.